Good evening, and welcome to our Maundy Thursday worship service. We're glad that you've joined us this evening here at First United Methodist Church of Paxton, and we welcome those who are watching on Facebook and listening on the phone, as well as the uh, few that we have here in the sanctuary this evening. So as we get started, I just want to share a couple of reminders of what's happening in the next few days around uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And uh, first remind everyone that following the service this evening, we will start a 23 and a half hour prayer vigil. We are asking people to just choose a 30 minute time segment that you would like to pray between eight o'clock this evening and 7.30 tomorrow evening. And you can do more than one if you wish to do so. Uh, we sent out a prayer guide in the mailing that went out last week. So refer to that if you would like to know some items to pray about. And then tomorrow evening at 7.30, we will have our regular devotion time, and that will be online only on Facebook as well as on the phone. And we'll have a special um, devotion and a couple songs that we'll share for Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday is coming up, and we are having the two services on Easter Sunday at 8 and 10.30. We, uh, we have probably close to... 40 at the 8 o'clock service signed up, and I think getting close to 50 plus on the uh, 1030 service. So there's still some space available. If you would like to come on Easter Sunday, let us know which service you would prefer to come to. And uh, we will be having communion at that service as well as communion this evening. So please be sure if you're watching or listening at home that you have your communion elements prepared. And those who are coming in person on Sunday, we will provide those for you. And then uh, between the services on Easter Sunday, we will have our adult Sunday school class, the Community of Viral Disciples meeting, and uh, that's at 9.15. And we're also having a uh, socially distanced safe Easter egg hunt for our young ones on Sunday morning at 9.15. And the junior and senior high Sunday school classes will be helping with, with that time. So uh, after the service on uh, Easter, the two services on Easter, we have the uh, meal, the Easter dinner, and uh, Cara picked up the names for that today. We got a good number of names for the Easter dinner, so thank you for signing up for that. And then just a reminder that we are starting in the book of James today with our Bible reading plan for the month of April. And uh, there was a prayer, or I mean a Bible reading plan in the newsletter that went out this week. And those who are here in person, there's one on the table in the overflow parlor area as well if you want to pick one up this evening. Um, I do want to also just share a couple of updates on the prayer requests. I'm not going to share a lot of prayer requests this evening, but I did want to let you know that uh, Bonnie Howard's sister-in-law, Barbara, passed away last night. I got a message from her just shortly after we finished our devotions last night. So we would ask that you keep her husband Jim and their family in prayer. And Bonnie told me when I talked to her today that they had been married for over 60 years. So this is going to be really rough on Jim and would ask prayers for their family. And then I also got an update today from uh, Gary Ripsky. And he says that uh, his cousin Jim's wife Evelyn is doing really well after she finished radiation treatments and was declared cancer free. And their little great grandson Owen is now just on maintenance treatments for his cancer um, or for his uh, treatments following his cancer surgery last fall. So we praise God for that and pray that he will continue to do well with that. And then I also wanted to share with you that I found out that uh, Terry Hancock is in the hospital right now having some tests done. So I would ask your prayers for Terry and also for uh, Richard during this time and pray that everything comes out okay for her. So with that, um, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to the call to worship for this evening. And it will be on the screens for those of you who are, are listening and watching from, uh, from home. I apologize to those on the phone that you can't see it. But uh, let's stand together as we join in our call to worship this evening. This is a night to remember. We remember the Passover Jesus shared with his disciples. We remember his new covenant of the broken bread and the shared cup. We remember his night alone in the garden of prayer. We remember his arrest and trial. We remember 
which suffering, his betrayal, and the denial by one of his closest friends. We remember his sinless hands, which were spread wide open as he blessed the bread and the cup, and then were nailed high on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We remember on this night and give thanks for Jesus' presence with us. And now let's join together in our opening unison prayer. Our loving and gracious Savior, on that night long ago, you knew that your hour had come. You knew full well what lay ahead of you. Your disciples loved you and followed you, but they also had failed you. They would fail you yet again that night, and one would betray you and another deny you. Yet you washed their feet as a servant would, even the feet of your betrayer. We have also loved and followed you, and we have failed you. We cannot comprehend the love you show us. May we be like you, Master, and serve others as your faithful disciples. May others see how we love each other, just as you have loved us. For it is in the strong name of our Savior Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and our choir is now going to share a choir anthem this evening, Behold the Lamb.
The scripture lesson for this evening is Mark chapter 14, starting with verse 12 through 26, and then verse 32 through 42. It's a rather long reading this evening. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then going down to verse 32, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. May God bless this reading and hearing of his holy word for tonight, for this is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. Would you please join your hearts in prayer with me? Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this very familiar story in the scriptures of the Last Supper and the events that happened after in the garden. We pray that you would open our hearts this evening to receive and hear your word and to hear your word proclaimed in this time. I pray that you would speak through me by your Holy Spirit to the people who are gathered, who are listening and watching from home as well, that we might be challenged and uplifted and encouraged in our living for you. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, I thought I'd start off with something for uh, April Fool's Day, since today is April Fool's Day, and I uh, want to give uh, credit to Mike Anderson, who sent this to me in an email this morning. So, Mike, if you're uh, watching out there, <laughs> you already know this. 
But it says in Florida, an atheist created a case against Easter, Easter and Passover holy days. He hired an attorney to bring a discrimination case against Christians and Jews and observances of their holy days. The argument was that it was unfair that atheists had no such recognized days. The case was brought before a judge. After listening to the passionate presentation by the lawyer, the judge banged his gavel, declaring, case dismissed. The lawyer immediately stood and objected to the ruling, saying, Your Honor, how could you possibly dismiss this case? The Christians have Christmas, Easter, and other days. The Jews have Passover, Yom Kippur, and Hanukkah. Yet my client and all other atheists have no such holidays. The judge leaned forward in his chair, saying, But you do. Your client, counselor, is woefully ignorant. The lawyer said, Your Honor, we are unaware of any special observance or holiday for atheists. The judge said, The calendar says April 1st is April Fool's Day. And Psalm 14, verse 1 states, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. Thus, it is the opinion of this court that if your client says there is no God, then he is a fool. Therefore, April 1st is his day. Court adjourned. <laughs> Aren't you glad there are judges that know the scriptures? <laughs> well, I want to share by, uh, start by sharing that uh, this is a year when the Olympics are going to be taking place. And uh, on the way to an Olympic gold medal, or even a silver or bronze medal for that matter, just to finish the race, there's a clash of wills that separates the fittest athletes from the faint-hearted. Strong-willed athletes tend to have the edge when it comes to disciplinary preparation and sheer determination. Those whose wills are weak often struggle. Every Olympic contestant's goal is to win the gold, but those participants who stay the course have no reason to hang their heads in shame. Disappointed they may be, yes. They might be discouraged, but defeated, no. In practically every area of life, including our religious faith, there are people who are designated as winners and losers. During this past year, we've all faced times of discouragement and disappointment because of this pandemic. When we, pulled down, when we are pulled down into despair or even fall into times of depression, we need to be reminded and encouraged that we are on the winning side. One of the advantages we have over Jesus' first disciples is that we are on this side of the cross and the resurrection. So we know that he defeated death and the grave. The early disciples were not there yet. As Jesus entered the final phase of his redemptive mission, he bowed to the absolute certainty and inevitability of the clashing of wills that would send him to the cross. But through it all, he kept his focus in the right place on God's purpose and plan for his life. Jesus understood that he was on the winning side. And humanly speaking, his burden was difficult to bear. Now, most of us have been there at some time in the sense that we've found ourselves between a, a rock and a hard place, and we face troubles and struggles in life. And as Jesus did on that last night of his life, we too have experienced that feeling of loneliness during those final hours of great distress in Jesus' life, not only did he have a difficult decision to make as to submitting to God's will versus following his own will, but so did the other participants who were a part of that final week on the way to the cross. Throughout this season of Lent, we have been looking at the people who were with Jesus on his way to the cross and those who were there when he was crucified. We're coming to the end of this journey. Tonight and tomorrow night and then into Saturday and Sunday is Easter. So tonight I want us to think about some of the people who struggled in those last hours of Jesus' life to truly understand what was happening 
as they too faced a clash of wills. To begin with, a decision by the Jewish religious leaders had set the tone for the events that would lead up to our Lord's hour of decision. How tragic it was that the religious leaders conspired to murder this teacher and prophet from God, who was on a mission to save people from their sins, whose innocence would be declared even by the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross, a story that we heard about a few weeks ago. For me, the lesson to be learned from the events leading up to the crucifixion is this. Love compels, but hypocrisy repels, even kills. Usually when we think of the opposite of love, what word comes to mind? Hate, right? But there are other opposites to love, including apathy or indifference, and sometimes hypocrisy as well. And each of us who encounter Jesus decides the path we will take in response to his claim, the way of love or the way of hypocrisy. So let's look at this contrast as we explore those who were with Jesus on this, on this journey, and especially on that last night before he went to the cross. First of all, at the beginning of Mark chapter 14, we hear another story that we focused on a few weeks ago, and it was love that compelled the anointing of Jesus while he was visiting in Bethany prior to going into the city of Jerusalem. A woman to whom Jesus meant more than words could convey that we declared was Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, decided to honor her Lord by anointing him with a rare perfume. We also looked at this story, as I said, a, a few weeks ago, but I bring it up tonight because this is the beginning of when the religious rulers began to conspire along with Judas against Jesus. Hypocrisy prompted the scolding of her onlookers, which brings to my mind an observation that I heard a teacher say once who said, sometimes a man or woman is wisest when his or her friends think that he or she is acting like a fool. These people who chastised this woman were the true fools in this story, even though they scolded her for being so foolish and wasteful with the perfume. Love compelled the affirming of this woman by Jesus, as he foretold that her act of extravagance would be mentioned everywhere the gospel was preached as an example of her unselfish devotion that love compelled. But there was hypocrisy working there that prompted the plotting to betray Jesus by one of the Lord's inner circle. A man who, like too many people in our day, had his price and therefore could be bought. In John's Gospel, Judas is quoted as saying, Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. And John goes on to explain, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. How often does money become a factor in acts of hypocrisy even to this day? Love compelled the observing of the Passover feast, which brings us to our scripture that I shared this evening. The Passover was an act of commemorating the love of God in the Old Testament as demonstrated by the deliverance of God's people from bondage in Egypt and also the love of Jesus Christ in the New Testament which would be demonstrated by his sacrificial death on the cross, a sacrifice symbolized by the breaking of the bread which represented his body which would hang on that cross and drinking from a cup symbolizing the shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Hypocrisy was perceived by Jesus to be present in the heart and mind of one of his closest followers, even after that, that uh, night when he uh, prompted the foretelling of a shocking denial by the apostle Peter. That's in the verses between what I read this evening in Mark chapter 14. On the way across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was partway up the Mount of Olives, 
Jesus had a conversation with his disciples, and especially with Peter, concerning his impending denial of his master. So whether love or hypocrisy prevails in the hearts and minds of followers of Jesus depends on the individual decisions that we make. If our decision is to do the will of our Heavenly Father, to submit to Him, then love prevails. But if our decision is to live our lives on our own terms, apart from the will of God, then hypocrisy often prevails. In the Garden of Gethsemane, love prevailed over hypocrisy as Jesus prayed about the decision he had to make. Now, don't you suppose that Jesus could have just stayed in that upper room to pray? Perhaps, but most likely he wanted to be alone and apart during his hour of decision at a time when there was a lot of activity going on in the city for the Passover and the house where they had observed the Passover might be raided at any time by those with whom Judas had conspired. So love compelled our Lord to go off and be alone with his heavenly Father as he agonizingly poured out his soul to God to see if there was any way that he could accomplish God's purpose and plan other than the way of the cross. Now it's okay, I believe, to want to be sure that what we are about to endure is indeed in God's will. Jesus' example shows us that this requires fervent prayer. As Luke describes in his account, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When was the last time you prayed fervently about a decision that you had to make in your life? Now, I doubt that any of us have had the experience of praying so fervently that drops of blood come off of our foreheads but maybe some sweat might if it's something that we really need to make a decision about that is difficult for us. Hypocrisy tempts us to seek the easy way out, to have it our way, but not Jesus. He prayed through until he was convinced that God's will and not his own would be done. Love compelled Jesus to address his heavenly Father with the use of a term of endearment when he said, Abba, Father, a word that means Daddy in the Aramaic, indicating an intimate relationship between Jesus and his heavenly Father. Hypocrisy may have been the cause of the disciples falling asleep that night, even though Jesus had asked them to stay awake and watch and pray. Now, I don't think they fully understood the agony that Jesus was going through as he prayed a short distance away from them. And since they had eaten a large meal for the Passover and then walked quite a distance to the Garden of Gethsemane through the Kidron Valley and partway up the Mount of Olives, they were tired. I know I feel tired after I've had a large meal. How many times do we find ourselves too tired to keep our eyes open when the Lord is depending on us to pray. Love compelled Jesus to react to his disciples' lack of dedication by giving them a reprimand when he came out to them. Are you still sleeping and resting, he asked. But then he affirms to them, my decision has been made. The hour has come and it is time to finish the purpose for which I came into this world. So will you commit yourselves on this night to stay the course until you finish God's purpose and plan for your life, whatever that might be, and even if you don't fully know what it is yet, or may not fully understand the reason why, why you are still here in this world. I've often told young people to keep praying and searching for God's direction and will in their lives if they're unsure about his plan for them. Most young people, when they're in, in junior high or high school, are still trying to figure it out, what God wants them to do with their lives. But on the other end of the spectrum, I've seen older people question why they are still here 
and whether God still has a plan for them. I watched my grandmother go through this as she spent the last three years of her life in a nursing home on oxygen 24 hours a day as a result of chronic emphysema and COPD. And I often tell older people that if they cannot do anything else any longer, they can still pray. And certainly our world needs a lot of prayer right now. Would you agree? (laughs) Hypocrisy reared its ugly head more forcefully than ever. As the moment of truth arrived for Jesus, when it was revealed that Judas' decision to betray him had been acted upon, and he betrayed the Lord with a kiss. That might be the height of hypocrisy. The one I kiss is the man, Judas said, arrest him and lead him away under guard. How often have you and I observed someone, even within our ranks in the church, pointing the finger of blame at someone else. Shifting blame onto a scapegoat may be the most disturbing act of betrayal known to humankind. But love compelled Jesus to react to his accusers calmly, with dignity, but sadly the same could not be said about his inner circle of disciples, as one of them, which is identified as Simon Peter in John's Gospel, cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest with his sword in the garden that night. Jesus simply reached out and touched the man's ear and healed it. Make no mistake about it, only because Jesus had made the decision to do his Father's will, no matter what the cost would be to him, did he refrain from allowing this band of disciples or even a legion of angels to come in to intervene on his behalf. Real love was in command of his decisions and his actions on that night. But what about the disciples? Well, sad to say, hypocrisy won the day for most of them. Not only did one of them betray him and one of them deny him, but they all, except for one, abandoned him at his last hours. It would not be until after the crucifixion and resurrection that they truly understood this final mission of Jesus to submit to his Father's will and purpose. So what about us? Will we choose to submit to God's will? and exemplify Jesus' love? Or will we go the way of the disciples and do it our way? And would you agree that love will prevail only if individual Christians willingly crucify hypocrisy and magnify love and devotion to our Savior Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself up for us? Amen. And let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks on this night that Jesus was willing to take the way of love, that he submitted himself fully into your hands and trusted you. And even though he had to endure the suffering of the cross, he knew that he was in your hands and in your care. He knew that it was your will that he go all the way and that he finish his course and purpose for which he came into this world. Help us to see him as the ultimate example of agape love, sacrificial love, and help us to be willing to lay our lives down for you and submit to your will in our lives too, no matter where that may take us or lead us. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. As we come to the Last Supper, to the table of communion this evening, I would invite you to be sure that you have your communion elements ready, and let's join together in our service of Holy Communion for this night. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sins, 
and seek to, be, to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Now we join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine. You formed us in your image, delivered us from captivity, and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us in him your crowning gift, emptying himself that our joy might be full. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now I invite you to get your communion elements ready as we share in Holy Communion together. This is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, given for you. And this is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Let us share in communion together. Let's share together now in the prayer after receiving. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There is an ancient tradition in the Christian church of stripping the church sanctuary following Holy Communion. It's a dramatic way of showing the desolation and abandonment of the long night that lay ahead of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and what followed after his arrest. And so at this time, we will strip the sanctuary as Judy comes and sings for us were you there when they crucified my Lord?
evening I want to remind you one more time about the 23 and a half hour prayer vigil that begins after this service this evening and invite you to choose a 30 minute time segment in which you can pray for our nation our world and our church and then remember uh, regular devotion time tomorrow evening at 730 with a special devotion message for Good Friday and then the uh, the events of Easter Sunday and uh, please join us for that, either in person or online or on the phone line. As we leave tonight, we are asking that everyone please be in meditation and leave the sanctuary in silence. Or if you're watching or listening at home, take a few moments to meditate on the meaning of this night. And now hear these words of benediction and blessing. Oh God, as we go forth tonight, may we remember what Jesus endured on that night so long ago, when he went to the garden to pray and submit himself to your will, and then would face the cross the next day. Lead us forth from this place and help us, Lord, to keep our focus on you, that we may always live in your way of love. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.